Thank you, Mark. And greetings, <laughs> I should say greetings and good evening to all of you. It's terrific to see so many people here tonight in support of one of the most worthwhile projects that you could possibly imagine. I'm here as a grandmother, not as a broadcaster. I uh, live in the area because of my grandchildren. I moved after 81 years living in Sydney to live in Bulleye opposite my two adored grandchildren. And so when Mark asked me to do this today, I thought, well, I'll take off the broadcaster's hat and put on the, the grandmother's hat. But I've also got the interviewer's hat on because I'm delighted to be able to introduce you to Nicolette Stevens. I know many of you know her and know of her, but many of you don't. So I hope tonight is a, a bit of a journey of discovery about a truly, truly remarkable woman and a truly, truly remarkable grandmother who really, oh, I'm gonna make a cry now. Um, before we go any further, Nicolette had major surgery on her teeth this week. She's been under general anaesthetic in hospital. So I think a special round of applause is in order. <laughs> I think there's a fair bit of Panadol um, doing its job. But I'm only going to laugh with like half of my face. Okay, she's going to talk and laugh with half of her face today. <laughs> so Nicolette, we'll get on to your extraordinary grandmother and she does sound like an extraordinary woman in a moment, but I want to find out just about, sort of set the scene. Where were you born? Um, so I was born in communist Romania in 1986. Um, there was three years before the um, very known event uh, when Ceausescu was um, basically executed um, by the uh, people of Romania, mm. yeah. So it was a notorious time in Romanian history, yeah. the communism that came to the, the state in the 60s, and I think, well, no, before that, but Ceausescu came in the 60s. Yeah. And he was a dictator. I mean, we heard about him and the orphanages and the horrors. Mm. Who were your parents? So, um, I was born, like, my, my parents, I always say that they were just married to make me, and that's it. Um, my mother had problems with her own parents and I think she just never learned to be a mother herself. And my father was an alcoholic. Um, so after my parents divorced, I was about six months old. Um, my mother decided that she didn't want my dad to have me at all, but she didn't want to have me either. So she just um, abandoned me in an orphanage. In one of Ceausescu's orphanages? Yes. So um, basically, Ceausescu never called these places orphanages. There were 24-7 care places where anybody could just drop their kids off and anybody could come and say, oh, this is my child. So a lot of like human trafficking happened um, back in those days as well. And um, I don't know, I was just very fortunate because my grandmother asked my um, biological mother where is the child? Because she'd known that my mother already abandoned another child, so my older brother in an orphanage, and she didn't want to say where I was, so my grandmother and my grandfather like, had to hire like a um, um, detective, like a private detective to find out where I was, and they found me and they took me home. How old were you? I was only six months old, so this happened between I was six until I was, I turned about one. And yeah, they just found me and they took me and they raised me. So the situation that you found, well, that you were found in, you're six months old, you're taken out of the orphanage by a grandmother, your father's mother, yeah. and taken to live with her and your father. Yes, because um, my father always, my father had about five wives and seven children, and um, but I was the only child that apparently he accepted and believed that I was his. Mm. And um, he, pro he had problems with drinking, but my grandmother always tried to make sure that he was around, that I had the parent around. I actually grew up not knowing about the situation. I only found out when I was about 15 about my history and the story. Mm. 
and that was when my biological mother knocked, waited for me so, um, in front of the school where I was studying. And she just told me like, I'm your mother. And I was like, I don't have a mother. <laughs> my mom died. And she said, no, you've been fed lies. And yet that's how I actually got to meet her for the first time when I was 15 years old. Is she still alive? Yes, she is, yeah. Are you in contact at all? So there was that period where I thought like, oh, I found my mother and I really wanted to explore a relationship with her. And I did move to live in with her, but she was married with a schizophrenic man. And a few months in us living together, I've understood that her reasons for me being there weren't right and he started to hit me and so I just ran away yeah after um, about nine months of living with her but we haven't had contact ever since mm. heck of a life isn't it really um, so but the redeeming feature of all of this is grandmother it's Maria grandma. yeah so tell me about Maria what was she like Did give us a description when people ask me about grandma, I always try and describe her as like this grandmother from the stories, you know, the beautiful stories, like Hans Christian Andersen type stories with the gentle soul and kind heart. And she always had a beautiful smile on her face, regardless of, you know, what, what was happening around and regardless of the problems that we had. And um, she was just beautiful and kind and I don't know you asked me um, the other day what was the biggest thing that she gave me and I always say she, she gave me love and yeah it was like the saving saving boat because we did like we didn't have money she was a primary school teacher and um, so in Romania primary school teachers are very badly paid and so her pension was very, very small, and she was trying to um, take care of my father as well, who was an alcoholic. I remember her hiding money in the Bible, and um, yeah, just so he wouldn't take her pension and drink it. So yeah, we sort of grew up in that mm. type of relationship, but um, you know, she, she always just showed me so much love, and just a hug from grandma was the best feeling ever. Yeah, mm. no matter what. That's what grandmothers are for, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I just remember sometimes if I had a bad day and, you know, I just sat with my head in her lap and she would just like, you know, pet my hair and just tell me everything's going to be all right. Yeah. It, it upsets you to think about it now? I think it, it upsets me only because I miss her so much. She passed away almost nine years ago. So actually, nine years ago on the 8th of March, my grandmother had a heart attack because of my father. And she basically refused treatment. So she said, I, I don't want to live anymore. I have to escape this cage. And he was her son. So yeah, she just passed away mm. 25 days later. Going back to the time when you were living together, mm. when she was raising you, you were going to school, she was a teacher, your father was in the house, although he was an alcoholic, so that must have had tension in the house between the three of you. So um, my father inherited a house from grandpa, after grandpa. Grandpa hired all his life very hard. He worked very hard all his life and he really wanted to leave his three children, my father and my two aunties, a house each. So after grandpa died, when I was one, um, my father inherited the house. And I actually remember um, like lines of alcohol um, at the doorway, at the entrance. And I, I actually ended up running away from home when I was six. So at that time, we lived separately and grandma just came through the day to look after me and she would go to her house. Um, I ran away when I was six. I remember I was wearing a red dress, like Little Red Riding Hood. That was my favorite story. So I went to grandma's house, like in the story. <laughs> uh, 
uh, took the train, and it was actually train number five, because we were talking about number five earlier. And um, I, I went to her and I said, I don't want to live with dad anymore. But shortly after that, he actually lost the house because he'd made a lot of, um, you know, I don't know if you lived with alcoholic people, like they just basically lose their brain. So it's alcohol actually eats at people's neurons. So you don't think logically anymore. So he lost the house for like some booze, yeah. And um, so he ended up homeless and grandma took him in, but because he had this thing with alcohol, he would always steal from my auntie's house. So we were tolerated in auntie's house with grandma, mm. with my father and with myself in a three by four room. But he wasn't allowed to go to the shower to go in the house anymore. He just, he was confined within those four walls and I was confined in, within those four walls with him and grandma, he was sleeping on the floor and I was sleeping on the bed and I was studying on the bed. And yeah, I just, mm. it was two beds and grandmother's hugs at night, yeah. It sounds to me that the stability in your life came from your grandmother. It was just, yeah, it was just her. The, the, on, the only stability in your life came from her. Yeah, and I think another gift that grandma gave me, and I like to talk about it, and um, I'm not a fanatical, but because sometimes when you mention religion, you know, people think like, oh, she's one of those. Um, <laughs> but, you know, um, I think another gift that grandma gave me and stayed with me after her passing was unwavering faith in something greater than us. And I think that carried me through a lot of hard times that I've had, you know, growing up and understanding that things happen for a reason, but you're never alone. And just sometimes I just imagined Jesus holding my hand and walking with me. And I've learned a little prayer that just get, keep me um, invisible in the eyes of the people they want to harm me. So. That, that was a prayer that she taught me that keeps going on. And I, I keep telling people that, you know, having something that you really believe in, that you're not alone, it's mm. a gift that she gave me that it's just, mm. it probably saved my life many times so far. I can imagine, I can imagine. And inserting into this story, it's, it, it, I mean, I think everybody in the room probably feels immense sympathy for the child that you were. I mean, the baby you were, then the child, and then the teenager. And we'll come to how you got to Australia in a moment, but can I remark on your blouse and your skirt, which is absolutely beautiful, and there's a very big story attached, isn't there? Yes, it is, and Grandma always told me that she doesn't have anything to give me when she's going to die, um, but all I, I would get from her would be this beautiful, it's a folkloric traditional costume that she really cared for um, because it was handmade by my great grandmother, was which her was mother? her mum. Yeah, her, mom. her mother, yeah. And I grew hand up, made. so it was handmade from scratch. And um, that's what um, I told Margaret earlier that um, grandma comes from a mountainous area where we have a lot of sheep, like here in Australia. And in, in that area, women basically, you know, um, take the wool and they make um, fabric with the wool and everything it's done by hand. And women grow um, going into these circles, like special circles where all the women gather and sew together and they tell stories together and they raise children together. It's a bit of like a community in the mountains. And um, actually, um, it's a UNESCO um, site, the cemetery, the Happy Cemetery, that's where my grandmother came from. And basically all the tombs have like um, lots of colors and um, funny stories about the people that died. Mm. And um, so this is a little village called Siget in Maramures in the mountains in Romania. Mm. And so growing up, because we didn't have a lot of space, grandma always, like every few months, had to take the costume out of the cupboard to air it out. Otherwise you get like moths and 
you know, dark spots, and she would just air it out. And I remember playing um, dress ups with with this with this costume and like dancing and being very happy. And um, in 2013, when I went for the last time home, she put it with her own hands in my mm. in my luggage, and um, I think she knew that was the last time that she would meet me. And we, we also have a photo. I gave Mark a photo. I don't know if he's. Um, I gave him, I, I gave Mark a photo with, like the last photo that I took with my grandmother when she gave me the, the yeah. costume, so. How old is the costume? It's over 100 years old, yeah. Yeah, coming in, I told everyone, I feel like um, Kim Kardashian wearing. <laughs> <laughs> wearing Marilyn Monroe. So Wearing, wearing Marilyn Monroe's dress okay. because it's such an ancient dress, and I was like, after the speech, I'm gonna take it off, fold it nicely, and I'm gonna make sure nothing happens to it. I'm not gonna drink anything. I'm not gonna eat anything with it on me. <laughs> you told your grandmother that you could change the world, and I want to know where you got that idea from. Um, just growing up, I, I had a lot of things that sort of not hallucinations, just things that popped in my mind, like images. And um, I, rem I remember being about nine or 10 and telling grandma that one day I'm gonna change the world. And I don't know how that's gonna happen, but I'm gonna change the world one day. And um, she really believed in me. There was, another, there was another gift that she gave me, you know, because sometimes you have these children who have visions for, for their own life. and. A lot of people will put you down because they go like, oh, you're dreaming. I mean, a lot of people told me, oh, Nicolette, they're going to fall off that cloud, like the stuff that's in your head. Who would imagine like, oh, someone who was, you know, abandoned in communist Romania would achieve the things that you've got in your head? And I said, well, at least I've got a cloud to get back on, <laughs> you know, because I've got all of these dreams and aspirations that keep me alive, that keep me wanting to get back up, you know, when I hit my head on the ceiling, so to speak. And um, I, I, I was always very artistic, and my father never wanted to let me go to art school. He said I would never make money out of arts. And I actually, I make money out of arts now. <laughs> 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 and um, I remember tell, telling grandma in Romanian that oh, one day I'm going to have a business and it's going to call, be called by Nicoletta. And I actually have a business now. And when I started it, I was like, oh, well, I, I don't even have to think about the name. It's going to be called by Nicoletta, right? But going back to like changing the world, um, I actually had an interview recently, I think, speaking about this. Um, I was in an abusive relationship in an abusive marriage when I came to Australia. And my, my life sort of seemed like, oh, I'm not really changing the world. Like there was, like I was driving the car or doing all of these things and I was, I'm not changing the world. And then um, there's this Michael Jackson song. Um, I always forget like the title, but it's just like, if you wanna make a change, you've mm -hmm. gotta change the world. It starts with you, like look at the man in the mirror. Oh, that's the name, the man in the mirror. <laughs> 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 Is it? Yeah. 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 And um, and that that was the time when I actually decided I'm leaving this relationship. This is rubbish. And I actually ended up running away from my ex-husband. It was on the 20th of December 2013. Grandma was still alive. And I packed this, I made sure it's packed, and I've had some other essential things that I packed. And I said, right, I've got to change. And it starts with me. And um, so, you know, I, I, in, in that moment, I think I just realized you don't have to be like a president and you don't have to be uh, some rich person to do things, right, to, to, to change the world. You can, like, do small things at a time and actually you can change one person at a time's world and then you because of the ripple effect. And I actually always think back to my grandmother, because we were poor and we were walking on the street. And pe I mean, in Romania, there's people sitting on the street and begging, like at every corner, right? And um, 
grandmother would like open the, the, the wallet and would give money <coughs> to the person. And I was like, well, we don't have any money. Like we've got nothing, right? And she was like, yeah, but we still have more than them. Like we, and that, that was another thing that grandma taught me, like gratitude. And I remember we were praying at the dinner table. And I mean, we had bread and water, you know, a lot of the times. And, you know, we would just like pray and thank for having a roof over our heads, not freezing in a minus 35 degree weather outside and being safe and, you know, so back to, you know, like how I want to change the world. And that was actually the story I told Mark when I first met him. And I was actually in tears because the story with, because of the story with Regina, she's a grandmother and, you know, she's changed her grandchildren's life. And like, I felt like my grandmother changed the world herself because she's changed my life. And then if I'm able to change one person's life, yeah. maybe they'll be able to change one. And it's just that like ripple effect that I was saying. But you know, there's also smaller things in life that you can change the world for someone. And I always give the example of, you know, you've had a bad day, you go to Woolworths. Like it's just some orky calls, no bias. Um, <laughs> and you know, like the cashier asks you like, how are you, how was your day? And sometimes we're grumpy, like we've had a hard day, right? And we're just like, oh, whatever. Um, but we can, you know, actually, use that moment and look at the person and say like, oh, you know, it was all right, but find something on them or with them that you can give them like a compliment and say, I really like your earrings. Just be honest, be genuine, you know, not like, oh, you know, Nicoletta told me to tell them I like something. Just, you know, find something that genuinely you like about them and you see like the bright smile, mm -hmm. you know, and then that person's day is changed. And they'll smile at everyone else after you. And then, you know, everyone else go, that have, have been served, ha if they have a nice experience like that, you know, they end up changing everybody's day, you know? And the thing is, we, we never know really what people go through. Um, in, and I, I think, I, I thought about that when my youngest daughter was born, and she's got a disability, right? And, but I think a lot of people experience when they lose someone or when you experience a lot of grief. And then you sort of imagine like, how is the world still moving when I'm experience this, experiencing this tragedy, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't know what they go through. If, you know, if, you, if you're able to give someone a smile or a nice compliment, maybe you, know, you just change their life. Because mm -hmm. I always tell people like, what's the influence they have, and it could be the last, you could tell someone the last words they ever hear. You could, like the things and we do and we say, could be the last, you know, could be the last drop in an ocean for someone. You know, like, I think I'm getting a bit too deep now. I'm losing confidence. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, the idea of changing the world and the whole business of change is what the project does this yes, project you know right, it yeah. changes the life of mm. children and families in Tanzania it's just yes. incredible um, mm. uh, I just quickly want to ask you about your business which is keepsakes by Nicoletta yeah what is it what's the what's the foundation of it so I, I actually make memorial um, jewelry with ashes and locks of hair for people who've passed away what how do you incorporate someone a lock of hair for instance in a, a piece of jewelry we, we have we use different techniques, but I make I basically make the stones either in glass or in resin, mm -hmm. and I like to shape stones, and then those stones are being set in like jewelry that people can wear forever. Mm. Yeah. That's a beautiful idea, actually, yeah. isn't it? Did I you make something from your grandmother by any chance? No, and um, actually when I took this costume out of, um, out of the frame that I had it in to show it to someone once, um, I actually found two locks of grandma's hair and I started to cry <laughs> because I always thought that I didn't have anything of hers. And I, in that moment I was like, oh, this is how it feels like to realize that you can have something made in memory of someone you really, really love. Um, so I've got, I've got her little lock of hair in my bag everywhere I go, and I'm just thinking of a design that has to, to work with it. <laughs> but it's with me everywhere, yeah. I think you're amazing. I really do. I think that having 
having moved through the life the way you've described it, the life you've had, mm. has been extraordinary and central to it is your grandmother. Yes, it is, yeah. It? And, you, you know, you said about forever projects and, mm. you know, how we can change, you know, how, how we can create change. And I think a lot of the times when you hear about, like, business owners and people who have money, you sort of um, think, oh, they're rich or, or money is the source of all evil. And then I'm like, why do they ask for money in church all the time if it's, you know, the source of evil? Mm. And... Um, Basically, I think money is is like a tool. You know, it's, it, it's, I compare it to a knife. You can use a knife to cook a beautiful meal for your family, or you can use a knife to kill someone, right? So it's not the knife's fault. So then, you know, when I started the business, like, you know, the vision, it's more than just making things and selling things, you know? That's why I like to be involved in um, projects like Forever Projects or t different charities because then I can make the money go further and I can utilize that as a tool to, you know, to help other people. And I think that's what we're all doing here, right? We're making a change, whether it's with $5, $10 or $5,000. It really doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. $5,000, please. <laughs> <laughs>